Pastor Aaron, and we are starting a new series, Up is Down and Down is Up. Uh, sometimes in our life, God says, I need a perspective change. And for the month of November, we believe God has given the church leadership a message of perspective change that we're going to share. Now, before we get too far into this, I wanted to address last week. Um, if you weren't here uh, at the end of Pastor Danny's message, he did something I know that caught a lot of you off guard. It caught us a little bit off guard um, as well. You may have noticed it on our face. Um, he ended his message a little unusual. He was preaching a message on, would the real Holy Spirit please stand up? And he, through advice and, and through Holy Spirit's prodding, felt that that moment had come where he needed to tell the church what we knew behind the scenes, that it was time for a change. Now, Pastor Danny uh, is answering the call that God has placed on his life and is going to devote his full efforts to bring clean and drinkable water around the world. In doing so, he's going to help plant hundreds, if not thousands, of churches in hundreds of countries around the world. He, he's currently been doing that and leading the church and carrying both burdens. However, both have suffered and are suffering, and it's not the plan that God has for his life. He is moving from a pastoral role to an apostle role. Paul in the New Testament moved from being the pastor to being over the churches. And pastor has felt for some time now that that's where God was moving him. We've had a plan as a pastoral team in place for quite a while. He spoke last week that the goal was always to turn this over to family. We knew about a year ago that eventually it would be Charity and I, that that was a process we were going to start. And we had what we thought was our timing, and God had a different clock. The plan became clearer the last few weeks, and we were actually going to announce it next Sunday and have a very formal announcement. <laughs> but as I said, Pastor prepared for his message. He, Holy Spirit spoke to him. He had information and prophecy spoken to him that morning that he shared last week that the lifelong pastor friend was telling him and knew none of, he shouldn't have known what he knew, but was speaking into the life of this church what God was trying to tell us. And pastor sought the advice of some close allies. If, if you feel like, well, why weren't we told? It's okay. I wasn't told either until it happened. So he brought us in front, and Charity and I are now leading from the front, the church. And I know that the timing and matter wasn't perfect, it wasn't prepared, it wasn't announced, but I think Pastor Danny has got the right to do whatever he feels is necessary, because that man's giving literally everything he has for us. He's given his life, he's given his health, his bank account, his wife, and so he moved, and we are following his spiritual guidance through this process. Now, Danny will still be around. He'll still be with us. Um, he'll lead the 830 service most Sunday mornings. We have a movement ser service where we worship and ex encounter Holy Spirit. Miracles happen. Lives are changed. We, we encourage you to be part of it, and he'll lead that service. We'll take the lead in the 10 a.m. service. He will lead the small group on Wednesday morning when he's here and he's available. Um, he has no plans to pack up and move away. In fact, I believe he said if anybody says that, he's coming for you. <laughs> there, the, the timetable, he's still here. He's In fact, he's in town this week, but he's preaching two services um, in town for Water for the World. Every time he fills one need, ten more needs show up. And so he's going to concentrate on giving the world the second most important thing that anyone could seek, which is clean, drinkable water, so they may have an opportunity to present Jesus. So I know that for some of us in this room, that may be bring the question, so what does that mean to us? Not much is going to change. Charity and I have been leading next to Pastor Danny for nearly a year now. When you give your kids the ability to drive, you don't just hand them the keys and say, hey, good luck, right? You take them out, you train them, you take them through the parking lot. 
And, and for years, we've been in the parking lot, and he's been training us and saying, don't do that. I wouldn't do this. Here's why, and here's, oh, I think that's really good. And then lately, he lets us kind of venture out on our own. But he's been with us. He's, he's been in the passenger seat. For the last year, Charity and I have pretty much led the way in everything we've done here. He's let us take the lead, and he's been the advisory role. So not a lot's going to really change. The music's not going to get any louder. <laughs> I'm still going to dress how I'm going to dress. What's going to stay the same is the heart of this place. Because what was birthed in this church nine years ago still resides in her and me because it's been Holy Spirit moving us along in this process. This isn't us. If it was us, I wouldn't have done it this way. I, I had plans for this grand announcement, and, and I'm very into words and how it's done. But we don't lead by my thoughts. We lead by Holy Spirit's thoughts. We want you to know that we're here for you. As Pastor begins to travel more and more, Pastor Danny, he, he wants us to take the burden. And quite frankly, we want to take on the burden of being the voice when you need encouragement, the voice when you need help, the voice to pray with you when you're in trouble. And so to clear things up, call us because we're here 24-7. Anything you need, we are here. In fact, to make sure you have it, we have our business cards in the back on the table. is Charity's business card and my business card, phone numbers and emails. We are available 24-7. I will answer my phone about 80% of the time because I don't know where it is, the other 20%. But Charity always answers. <laughs> we, we both have strengths and we both have weaknesses. We have spent long uh, amounts of time in counseling with each other, with outside advisors on how to do this together as a team and recognize it. We've been praying a long time and we'll talk about that in a moment. But I... So the question is, who's in charge? Like, someone has to be in charge. Is Aaron in charge? Yes. Is Charity in charge? Yes. Can two people be in charge? Yes. How's that going to work? Yes. <laughs> we we, we kind of have it between the two of us. There's no better ear. There's no better sympathetic voice. There's no more loving voice than my wife. When your time is in trouble and need, that's the voice to listen to, because I've experienced it firsthand, and I know many of you have. And for me, I'm the faith guy. You need to say your situation's going to be all right. God's going to move, then come to me, because I'm the crazy one that just believes the Bible. And even when everything around me says it shouldn't, I still believe it does, because I've seen it work in my life. But I want to make something very clear right here at the front. This church is not Aaron Roberts' church. This church is not Charity Roberts Church. This church isn't even Danny Thomas Church. This church is the bride of Jesus Christ. This is his holy church, and we will never do anything that is displeasing and offensive to him. And our job is to honor, bless, and serve Holy Spirit. This is not the end of Grace Place. This is not the end of an era. This is a new phase in God's plan for this church. And if you think you've seen some amazing stuff, trust me, you haven't seen anything yet. I've never been more convinced of God's goodness and God's timing and his plan for this group of people than I am at this moment in this time of history. So there's going to be some bumps, there's going to be some bruises, but come with us on this journey. It will be everything you've heard it can be because this is just the beginning. So I didn't plan on doing this big speech at the start of my message today. And I really tried to avoid it and I went a couple minutes longer. Because the message series I have to preach today and start this month can be seen as, well, they're really speaking a different direction. They're really, they're really looking at what we've been doing here and we feel God has been birthing something in us for quite a while. And now is the time for us to finally reveal it to you and speak it to you. We, we got together as a team about four or five weeks ago, and I've been praying, like, what do we do in November? What do we do in November? And, and I felt God's push to say this. I talked it over with Danny, and he was like, no, let's do it. And we worked on it, and we've talked about it. And so this message was done weeks ago before last week. I'm going to take kind of a big risk today. I'm going to rely on Holy Spirit to speak. 
I'm going to risk everything I have and be completely honest with you and be open with you and kind of give you a look behind the curtain into our life so you can understand why I'm up here saying what I'm saying. We're going to focus our time today in 2 Kings chapter 7. So you can start getting your book, uh, Bibles together and we're going to have a reading here in a minute and kind of go over it. But I have to start with chapter 6 because crazily that becomes before 7. So I have to give you some background to our story. It's a, a time in Israel's existence that they've had some victories, they've had some battles. In this particular time in history, in 2 Kings chapter 6, they're under siege. They are surrounded by a great army. They are outnumbered. They're hiding out in the city of Samaria. Their walls are built up so nothing can get in. The problem is food can't get in. Resources can't get in. There's nowhere to grow where they are. There's no food where they are. They're running out of food, and their situation has become desperate. And they can't exactly go outside the gates. They'll get killed. In siege warfare, the idea is to outlast your opponents and starve them to death. The situation's pretty dire. It says in verse 25, chapter 6, that 80 shekels of silver are being paid for a dead donkey's head. And they're using that to have dinner. That doesn't sound really good. For a small cup of dove's dung, you can pay five shekels of silver. I don't know how you cook bird poop. I don't know what you would do. Do you boil it? Do you make a paste? I don't know what you do with it. But it's five shekels of silver. They're that desperate at this moment. They're so desperate that the king is walking through his land in the side, the city, and he's just torn apart. And a woman walks up and says, King, King, I need your help. And he's, what can I do, lady? What can I do? What can I do? Well, me and my friend, we were starving, so we made a pact. We were going to boil our infant children. And today, yesterday, we boiled my child and we ate it because we have nothing else. And today it's her turn to buy, boil her child, and I can't find her. She reneged. She ran away. I've killed my child for nothing. You should get her, king. And as you would expect, the king, seeing the state of his people, <coughs> tore off his clothes to reveal all he was wearing was a bur burlap sack. And he walks through his city, and the people watch their king cry out to God, It's your fault. You did this and I'm going to kill your prophet. So that's the events that lead up to chapter 7. They're desperate. They're dying. They can't figure out a way forward. So in despair, you happen to listen to me try to read and talk at the same time. We're going to have story time. So if you don't have your Bible, that's okay. Pastor Charity is going to start at the end of chapter 6 and read us through chapter 7. While Elisha was still saying this, the messenger arrived, and the king said, All this misery is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? And Elisha replied, Listen to this message from the Lord. This is what the Lord says. By this time tomorrow, in the markets of Samaria, six quarts of choice flour will cost only one piece of silver, and twelve quart quarts of barley will cost only one piece of silver. The officer assisting the king said to the man of God, that couldn't happen, even if the Lord opened the windows of heaven. But Elijah replied, you will see it happen with your own eyes, but you won't be able to eat any of it. Now there were four men with leprosy sitting at the entrance of the city gates. Why should we sit here and wait to die, they asked each other. We will starve if we stay here, but with the famine in the city, we will starve if we go back there. So we might as well go out and surrender to the Armenian army. If they let us live, so much the better. And if they kill us, well, he would have died anyway. So at twilight, they set out for the camp of the Armenians. And when they came to the edge of the camp, there was no one there. For the Lord had caused the Armenian army to hear the clatter of speeding chariots and galloping horses and the sound of a great army approaching. 
The king of Israel has hired the Hittites and the Egyptians to attack us, they cried to one another. So they panicked and ran into the night, abandoning their tents, their horses, their donkeys, everything. They fled with just their lives. When the lepers arrived at the edge of the camp, they went into one tent after another, eating and drinking, and they were carrying off silver and gold and clothing, and they hid it. Finally, they said to each other, this is not right. This is a day of good news, and we aren't sharing it with anyone. If we wait till morning, some calamity might certainly fall on us. Come, let's go back and tell the people at the palace. So they went back to the city and told the gatekeeper what had happened. We went out to the Armenian camp, they said. No one was there. The horses and donkeys were tethered and the tents were all in order, but there wasn't a single person around. Then the gatekeeper shouted the news to the people in the palace. The king got out of bed in the middle of the night and told his officers, I know what has happened. The Armenians know we're starving, so they left their camp and have hidden in the field. They're expecting us to leave the city, and when they do, they will take us alive and capture our city. One of the officers replied, we had better send out scouts to check into this. Let them take five of the remaining horses. If something happens to them, well, it's no worse than if they stayed here and died with the rest of us. So two chariots with horses were prepared, and the king sent scouts to see what had happened to the Armenian army. They went all the way to the Jordan River, following a trail of clothing and equipment that the Armenians had thrown away in their mad rush to escape. The scouts returned and told the king about it. Then the people of Samaria rushed out and plundered the Armenian camp. So it was true that six quarts of choice flour were sold that day for one piece of silver, and 12 quarts of barley grain were sold for one piece of silver, just as the Lord had promised. The king appointed his officer to control the traffic at the gate, but was knocked down and trampled to death as the people rushed out. So everything happened exactly as the man of God had predicted when the king came to his house. The man of God had said to the king, by this time tomorrow in the markets of Samaria, six quarts of flour will cost one piece of silver and 12 quarts of barley of grain will cost one piece of silver. The king's officers had replied, that couldn't happen, even if the Lord opened the windows of heaven. The man of God said, it will happen. You will see it happen with your own eyes, but you won't be able to eat any of it. And so it was, for the people trampled him to death at the gate. Land in famine. We're going to go kill the prophet. God speaks and says, tomorrow, 24 hours, it's all going to change. And the guy looks at him, and the king's messenger looks at him and goes, no, it's not. <laughs> Even if God empties out heaven and the window's open, it's not going to happen. And the prophet says, you're going to see it, but you're never going to taste it. Scene change. Immediately we go from that scene to outside for, to the lepers. No understanding, no reason why, no thematical you know, grammar, let's put these two stories together. God speaks here and he moves here to four lepers who don't know any better. They don't know what's going on over here. They just say, hey, we're going to die there. We're dying here. Maybe we won't die over there. They go. The camp's empty because God made a sound as a giant army. And the enemy dropped everything it had. So what's that have to do with us? I'm glad you asked. We're going to spend the rest of our time together this morning examining where we are as a church and where we feel God is not asking, he's not suggesting, he's pushing and telling us to go. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for this moment to come together and gather as a community and seek more of you in our life. We pray this morning that your Holy Spirit speaks through it to us that your words are here, that what we're about to look and review, have revealed to us is nothing man-made, it is God-made. God, we pray that your hand continues to be upon this church and bless us in this moment. And we give you full reign. Our eyes are open, our ears are open, our hearts are ready. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. As I said uh, earlier, I would mentioned that last week's events weren't a, hey, here's a good idea moment. We've been praying about these kinds of things for a really long time. Like, not just, dear Lord, bless this church. Like, everything we've got, where do we need to go, God, as a church? And we, we, we've stepped out sometimes, we feel time to steps, and other times we've, we've held off and we've felt to held off. But on the side, we really felt God was trying to build and prepare us for something. Charity and I have become laser-focused in 2016, really discovering what that is. And asking God to lead us to where we need to be as leaders, as shepherds, and directors of a church, and as a husband and wife. 
We did something different to start this year. We started the year off with a 21-day fast. I say it not to brag, but I say that we decided to give up some things. For us, it was anything that tasted good and anything that tasted sweet or sugary. And for 21 days, we didn't eat it. And we took that effort and time and prayed. I prayed a lot. Dear Jesus, don't let me eat the cookies. But I, I was in communication with God a lot. We set up prayer times in our daily life. And we set up time where we watched, I think in 21 days, maybe 30 different teachings, messages, and instruction. And we let God speak to us. And we came out fired up, knew that God had just really been building something up into us. And we, we've prayed about it every week and every day since. We, we set aside Wednesday specifically a big block of our time where we just put away work, we put away everything, and we just pray for all of you. And we pray for this place. We pray for God's direction in our life. So we've been praying. and we've, we, you, you ever like pray and you're like, God, I know you've got this answer, but I have no idea what it is, but I'm just going to keep praying? That's, that's where we were. And we prayed, and we prayed, and we prayed, and our prayers became, okay, God, we, we know you want us to move forward and be, do something, but we're going to wait for you to supernaturally work. We know kind of the outlines of this plan, and we want you to supernaturally make it happen. So that's what we're going to believe in, a good, faithful prayer. We got to September. Middle of September, I looked at Charity before our prayer time on the winds, and I said, I got nothing. I keep praying, God, move, God, move, God, move, God, move, God, move, and I don't feel like he's moving. What have we done wrong? Where did we screw up? What direction? Where did we miss? And Charity goes, so then we pray about it. When you don't know, go to find out from the one who knows. Okay, fine, whatever. Really, was that not, not like depressed, not angry at God, but just really searching, like, what do you want? I can't figure it out. Where did I screw up? So we started praying, and we prayed, and we prayed, and the 30 minutes turned into 50-some minutes, and we're both crying, and my hair is a mess. And <laughs> We come out of it, and I look at it, and I say, we've been waiting for him to move, and he's been waiting for us. And he says, when we move, he'll move, that our movement will activate faith, which will activate him. We've got it all backwards. And it was this crazy, like, da-da moment. And we got up and we went, okay, so let's move. Where are we going? I don't know. I don't know. I, well, we got to go. God says move forward and do. And we're like, I don't know. But I know I, I know this time. I know that he said something. And over the next week or two, we started to get kind of like, okay, I think this is where we're going to go. And this is how it's going to move. And so we went. Whenever you hear from God, you always have to go, is that really you? I need a second of voice. I need this again. Uh, maybe it's just me who says, okay, God, I, I'm pretty sure it's you, but can you do it again? So we went to our supernatural conference in October. I tell you, we go there because it is not a let's go down and feel good about ourselves. Let's go have church programs. Let's go, you know, five ways to build your church. No, this is three, four days of pastors from all over the country coming together and say, all right, Holy Spirit, we're here. What do you need from us? What can we do for you? And we, we go through a time of spiritual renewal and refreshing and developing and growth. And we let Holy Spirit talk to us and move in us. So Charity and I, we're going to go to a conference. We're, God's going to tell us what to do. Yeah, let's do that. Sounds good. Let's do it. So we go to the conference. We sit down. First night we're there. Remember, I told you, God, you got to tell me again. This is time when men get prophetic. Certain men. There's a great pastor uh, in Phoenix. Mike, Dr. Mike Maiden, who I've seen over time to know when Mike talks, Pastor Mike talks, you listen. And you can stand and you'll just quietly go around the room and have something for everyone. And he's right on the dot. So he stands up and he pulls out his phone. I just really feel like God's got this on my heart this morning or this evening. And I wrote it down on my phone so I could tell it back to you just as I heard it. Because for someone in this room, you've been praying, God, Move, God do, and God's prayed, or God has spoke back to you that it's time to move, and you've asked for a second voice, and so I'm here to tell you that's God, and he's saying it's time to move. He's going to move in you, he's going to move in your church, what he's calling you to do, it's time to go. So Charity and I, of course, look at each other like, what? What was that? Like, 
I don't know him, you don't know him. But when, when, when someone speaks to a room, sometimes you know he's speaking right to you. And he was speaking right to us. And it was kind of like, okay, God, we got it. And so for four days, that kept happening. Word after word after word after word. By the end, we're like, okay, we got it. <laughs> the last night, the preacher's talking, and he's talking like right to me, but he's not talking to me, and I'm bawling like a baby. Like, okay. So we, we went away for four days, and God moved, and he spoke, and he ignited something that, for me, I got saved, I got recommitted, and I had the week of October 1st through the 5th where God himself reached out from heaven and said, I got you. We can do this. It's time to go. So I told you we're standing there. We're like, what? What do you want? Where do you want to go? And his reply was simple. It's time for the church to move and go forward to what I've called them to be. For a long time here at Grace Place, to be quite frank, we've enjoyed our own company. We've enjoyed worshiping God. And I think that, that this is what we're going to continue to do. We've enjoyed taking part in communion with each other and community with each other. And as a pastoral team, we have dropped the ball, all of us, and not spoke to you. We've spoke around you. We've, we've taught you pretty sermons and, and good, knowledgeable stuff. But it hasn't inspired you to something. We have led you to Christ, and then life has taken over. We've led you to Christ, and then he's just been a part. From this day forward, this church will have one goal when we speak. That is to speak into you that you each have purpose and a direction that God has made you for, and we are going to speak it into you, and we are going to train you to be the feet and hands of Jesus in a community right now that is dying. And that's, that's I, I, know, I know we all get it, but let's just remember, this isn't a game. We're not pushing reset at some point. They're not getting a second chance. They're going to hell. They're going to burn for eternity. They're broken. They're lost. They are like the people. They are like the Israelites. They have taken what the world has given them. They are paying everything they've got, saying your, your donkey brains are so good. Your bird brains are so good. We're sacrificing our children. We've let them grow up to be whatever they want to be, whatever goes, man, whatever he is. And the rest of us are going, well, I wish we'd just elect somebody who would do something different about it. That's like, I didn't wait for a politician. I didn't send uh, something. I sent you. We're the voice of a community that's dying and desperate and looking for anything real. And the church, for hundreds of years, has told them rules and condemnation. Or, you're not one of us, so stay out. We get in arguments about the best way to worship and the right way to worship and the right music and the right sermons and the right things. And we move, lose the plot that it's all about coming together, getting built up on Sunday, getting restored, coming with the mindset that says, I'm not just here for me. God's got something for me. He has something for you every time we gather. But he has something for you to take to someone else, too. We have to have the mindset that it's me and someone at every moment of our life. Lives depend on it. We're nine years in. We're an 85-person church. And I can talk around it. We can talk softly about it. Or we can say, God expects more. This doesn't beat you up. Some of you have been like, well, life just isn't been going well. Life just, Aaron, I've heard about, I just can't. There is nothing more refreshing and invigorating and filling as when you eat and move in God's purpose. 
Nothing will make you feel different. How do you know? Because this guy was miserable for 32 years of his life. I knew God and was miserable. I knew God but was down. I knew God and, and fell apart all the time. I knew God but was empty. Six, seven years ago in a room down in Tacoma, I bawled at three in the morning. Okay, I finally, everything you want from me, you got. Everything you want. I, I'm done. Nothing's working my way. I didn't want to be one of those weirdos who talked about Jesus all the time. I didn't want to be one of those happy-go-lucky, how's it going? Those were weird people. But somehow God, when I said do whatever, he made me whatever. And he led me to what I am today. And the best part about it, I'm only part of what I'm about to be. I'm only a little glimpse of what I'm going to be. I don't want to be like the king in that story. Well, God, it's not really going well. Your fault. I'm not saying it's the king's fault. In fact, I was reading commentary of the week. This problem with the king was not that he was upset. Not that God was punishing him, because he wasn't. He forgot that God had been good to him in the past and decided where he was couldn't get any better. He'd forgotten that just a few years before that, he had delivered them over and over and over and over and over. And he didn't recognize that God could change things in 24 hours. We have to be careful in our life to say, well, I've lived life, Aaron. It doesn't work that way. This isn't my way. I wish it was. It'd be a lot simpler. I wouldn't have to stress about the things I have to stress about. I wouldn't have to worry about the things I'd have to worry about. We could all go home, feel happy and joyful, and oblivious to the reality of what's going on. Unfortunately, God won't let me do that. Nothing I'm saying is, pay attention, wake up. I'm trying to draw out of you that I am here, and I will dedicate who I am. And Charity is dedicating who she is to make you and train you and inspire you to be everything God has called you to be everything he's called you to be. The messenger looked at the prophet. He heard the word of God and said, that can't happen. I can't. Experience tells me that can't happen. Experience tells me that can't happen. Experience tells me it could. It might. So certainty is not doing anything. Certainty is staying when doing what I'm doing. But it might just work if I go his way. It might just work. You have those people, and you have the four lepers who, it's really weird when you tell a story and say, be like the lepers. Be like the sick people. Be like the outcasts. Be like the people that are outside the city because no one wants anything to do with them. The king doesn't get it right. The people are not getting it right. The messenger's not getting it right. But four lepers go, you know what? Life was good in the city, but if we go back there, we're going to die. We're alive right now, but if we stay here much longer, we're going to die. Let's be crazy. Maybe they'll, we'll go over to the army, and maybe they'll, they'll arrest us, and maybe they'll spare us. Worst case scenario, we're going to die. My one out of four chances to live is to go that way. The world outside this door is filled with real men and women, fathers, daughters, fathers and mothers, sons and daughters, their neighbors, your co-workers, they're strangers in your world. Some of them are there, you're your family, they're your sons and your daughters. They're your mom and dad. The world full of broken, hurting, lost, going the wrong direction people. I could Stand up here and continue saying, it's really bad out there. It's really bad out there. Bunker down. Get through it. But instead, I'm going to tell you, it can change. It can be different. In fact, we're called to go and be the light into a dark world. We're supposed to take the light where there's no light. We're supposed to take the good news where all there is is bad news. We're supposed to take hope where there is no hope. We're supposed to take love where there is no love. We could try it, and it could fail. 
but it might just work. Because quite frankly, this church can no longer afford to do what we've been doing. We can't go back to what we used to do. Good things, good things, better things when we walk out our life towards God's purpose, even when it looks completely scary, and trust me, it looks completely scary at times. But that's the only place I see hope, is a church that gets out of neutral and moves into drive. Your family needs you to move. Your life needs you to move. Your finances need you to move. Need you to take that step. In your notes, the first note is, it's time to move forward. It's time to move forward. The future is in front of us. It's not behind us. And not was what was, but what will be. Yesterday's bread, yesterday's manna can't sustain you tomorrow. It's time to move forward. Your second point. We must move forward in each of us, committing to live the purpose God has for each of us. Which means I, insert your name, have a God-given purpose. None of it works unless you accept that God made me for a purpose. He made me for a reason. He's given me the tools to do something, to, to live something out. So it's I, insert your name, I, Jim, I, Maya, I, Mike, I, Gabby, I, Juanita, have a purpose. There's no exemptions. I'll show you. Ephesians 2.10. It's Ephesians 2.10. It won't come on the screen. I'll just read it. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are his craftsmanship. We are his perfected work. And he created us for good works, which he decided for us a long time ago. Since before there was a you who knew someone, who knew someone, who knew someone, and somebody winked at the someone, God had a purpose for you. He had something for you to do. There's no, well, you know, I, I'm over the 65, ARRP sends me my voter ballot and sends me all my information. I'm retired. If you can still walk, if you can still have a beating heart, if you still have a beating heart, that qualifies everyone. God still has a purpose for you. He's not done yet. He's not done yet. God's not done with you yet. I think some of us have forgotten that God's not done with me yet. I'm not supposed to just exist. I don't know what it is, and we're going to discover it together. I told you, my aim is going to be to teach you you have purpose and how to reach your purpose and how to live out your purpose and that you have one. He's not done with you yet. He's not done. Some of us, we hasn't even started. I felt like he'd started, and then I got this word the last few weeks, and I'm like, I haven't done nothing yet. I got so much left to do. I'm so excited, and I'm so freaked out, but it's okay. The Bible talks about, and we'll talk about it in a couple weeks, that when you walk in God's will, it is the sensation of like eating like the best meal ever. John 4, a woman at the well, Jesus speaks to the, the, the woman, and she goes and starts telling people, and the disciples are like, hey, who fed you? He's like, I eat bread that you don't know about. I was doing my Father's will. When you do God's will, he is saying, it fills you like nothing else can. Money won't do it. You've tried that. I know you have. Drugs won't do it. Alcohol won't do it. Clothes won't do it. Friends won't do it. Family won't do it. Farmville won't do it. Sports teams won't do it. I've lived through 0 and 12. I was not happy. Now I'm 9 and 0, and I'm still on the edge. But what fills us is when we walk out God's purpose. I was richer. I was in better status in my life before, and I was miserable. Now... I'm surviving, and I'm better in the inside than I've ever been because I'm walking out God's purpose and will in, in my life. The third thing I will promise you in this is we are not going alone in this journey. 
it looks scary because it could be like, well, if I move forward and I do something I've never done before, and if I, if I give you everything I got, Aaron, like, I don't know if I can do it, but you're not going alone. The lepers walked on a chance. They didn't have God's word. They didn't have God's promises. They, they just took a natural chance. And God was able to use them. And as four people walked, the army heard not one. They heard two armies coming. They, found, they heard a noise. They didn't hear noise. God doesn't make noise. God makes a sound. Sound. Listen for sound in your life. It's the key to when God's moving. He makes sound. He doesn't make noise. And he makes a sound. And they go, they've hired the Egyptians. They've hired this army. We're all done for. We need to run. They didn't wait to see the army. They just heard it. And they ran. And all it was was four guys going, where are we going? Where are we? All right. But the army heard, boom, boom. Boom, the earth shook, the ground shook, the trees and the bushes shook. It brought fear. But the Bible never says the lepers heard the sound. They heard nothing. They just walked. But in the heavenly spiritual realm and in the natural realm, God was going before them and he was making a sound that scared the enemy so much they left behind everything they had. They didn't like, well, let's take all our stuff and go. They just, they were terrified and they ran. What would it look like if this church got together and said, okay, we're going to commit the rest of our existence as a community? Because let's make this clear. I'm not the church. That's not the church. Danny's not the church. This building's not the church. The group of people gathered together in one unity are the hands and the feet and are the body of the church. Church is not something we do from 10 to 1130 on Sundays. It is who we are at 11.30 until next week at 10 a.m. So let's make sure we're not thinking like, well, Aaron and Charity are going to move and we're just going to watch. No, if all of us as the church got together and said, let's live out God's purpose, let's go and be bold enough to walk forward with God. I don't hear a sound. Do you? Nope. No, I don't hear that. But we're going to keep going. God will go before us and he is going to make a sound that the enemy is going to hear. And as he makes that sound, the enemy's going to drop what they possess. And we're going to be there to pick it up. That means broken lives will no longer be the devil's possession. They will be, the enemy will have to leave them behind to save their own hide. And we'll be there to pick up the broken pieces of families, uh, of children, of grandparents, nieces and nephews, your children, their children, your moms and dads, your nieces and nephews, your co-workers, all of it. Financial provisions will be dropped and the church's job will be to pick it up, plan it, and then use it to go out and reach more people because we're not going to go all alone as we move boom 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 god will make us sound the israelites leave egypt and they go to the desert they get to the edge and they look over and then they say that's too scary and they turn around and they go back and for 40 years god keeps them going around in circles 40 years late after that event Joshua is now in charge, and he's standing at the edge of the Jordan River with the people, and they're ready to go into the land. Finally, they're ready to go where God's told them to go. And God gives a command in Joshua chapter 3, verses 2 through 4. He says, as soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, your God, being carried by the Levitical priest, then you should set out from your place and follow it. There shall be a distance between you and it, about 2,000 cubits in length, don't come near it. In order that you may know the way you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. The ark is God's presence. And he is saying, I'm going to go out in front. And you follow me, because where we're going, we've never been before. And if we rely on us, we're going to get lost. But we're going to rely on God to, to lead the way, and we're going to follow him. We're not going alone. He is with us. He's leading the way. So we're going to be bold enough to say, if we might just, if we go, we might just live. 
There is no other option but to go forward into God's purpose for this place and for us. I told you they were, they were there 40 years before Joshua's moment in Joshua. So back in Numbers, when they're standing at the edge, seven spies, five say, we ain't going there, it's scary. Two say, let's go. In Numbers 14, starting in verse 6, it records what Joshua had to say then. Remember, this is the first time they get there, and everyone else wants to turn. The land which we pass through to spy it out is exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into a land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord. Don't give up. Don't dismiss it. Don't doubt it. Don't stay behind. Don't quit. Don't turn around and go back. And do not fear the people of the land. Don't worry about what they're going to say. Don't worry about what others are going to think. Don't worry about how people react. For they are like bread to us. I read that last night and began to cry. That if we move and don't get scared, that the people out there, they look big and scary, but if we talk to them, they are like bread. I told you, John 4, and you'll hear it more. I eat God's will in my life when it fills me. Our, God's will is for us to reach those people and it will fill us like nothing else. A church where everyone is taking your next step towards God. We're not going to get there tomorrow. But every time we gather in every situation and every moment, we're going to take a step. And everyone's going to be focused on Wherever you are in life, whether this is your first day or your 80th day as a Christian, or your 100th, you're going to take a step. Every, your life will be consumed. God, what's my next step? What is my next step you were looking for me? We have to change the perspective. I said the message series is up is down, down is up. We have to change the perspective of what we're doing here. Because quite frankly, if we continue doing the way we've been doing things, no matter who's in charge, this church won't make it till January. It's not to freak anybody out. It's to say, this is pretty good. But it's not meant to last because what's meant to last is going forward to what God has for us. And he's waiting for us to move because he's ready to move. He's ready to move. We've seen the mountains move before. We've passed through brokenness before. We've passed through fear before. So we're telling God, okay, we're going to go. And we're going to go different. And we're going to go in a different place. But you've done it before. You're going to do it again. I can go, charity can go. But my life's kind of pointless if I can't inspire you to go with us. Because it's not about me. My life is about helping you go forward. About giving you the tools and the, and the things so you can walk out and do the ministry and speak to people I can't speak to. And talk to people I can't reach. And invite people I can't reach. You get them here, you feed into them, and, and I, will, I will teach and I will train. But then you're going to walk side by side with them. Because when, when someone close to you walks with you in something and explains something and, and helps you discover, how much deeper does it stay in you? When you read the word and it, and it impacts you, it's a lot better than when I read it to you, right? All I can do is kind of spread the seed out. Sometimes it's going to sink in. But if you really want to burrow in God's word and burrow in God's purpose and burrow in what God has for you, you walk it out every day of your life. So you walk it out with others. And as you begin to take that first step, well, they're going to think I'm a weirdo. Hi, do you want to come to the Polar Express party with me? Yeah. Okay. Hey, how was that? I really liked it. I like this place. Hey, you want to hang out and have coffee next week? Why? I just want to talk. Hey, can I tell you what Jesus did for me? That's all it is. It doesn't even have to be his story yet. You just tell your story. 
That's where life's going to be changed. You're, not, you're voting on Tuesday. For what? Neither of them are going to do anything. I mean, I mean they're gonna, one's going to blow it up and one's going to blow it up. One's going to screw it up and one's going to screw it up. We all thought for the last, my, I'm into politics for 40 years. I've been hearing about this is the end. And it just keeps getting worse. Nothing gets better no matter who we think's in charge. Because it's time for the church to do the work. Stop relying on someone. Don't rely on me. Don't rely on charity. You can do it. You have purpose. You have something valuable within you that God wants to use. So the perspective isn't, I'm not coming here just to hang out and enjoy church. I'm coming here to hang out, enjoy church, learn, find something, have it revealed within me, and then find a piece of it to take to someone else. If this place is, it's me and someone. 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 That's how we should live our life every day from here on out. And as we walk that out and we take our step towards God every day, you will see signs and wonders. He didn't stop working or he he didn't stop moving. He just watched his church over thousands of years become sedentary and in neutral. We don't have time. We don't have time. So, some of you I know is like, oh, this is a lot. This isn't yesterday's, hey, I have a great idea. This has been burning in me for years, and it's finally coming out. So I ask, and I've told the leadership team, there are times when you just got put in on my shoulders. If you're not sure, just, just, just say, hey, Aaron, I'm going to give you 60 days, and I'm going to live my life going every day one step closer to God. Every week I'm going to examine my one step and at the end of 60 days, if you do that and you work towards your purpose and you live out your purpose and and you commit everything, time, energy, money, all of it, in 60 days you come back to me and tell me it didn't work. That you don't feel better. You don't feel different. And I'm going to stand there and go, I told you, it didn't work. Because he won't. Because he doesn't speak lies. His word doesn't return void. So be brave. Come with us. And I will be with you. And I will encourage. And I will do everything everything I can to help you find the purpose God has for you. Dear Jesus, we thank you for this moment where we've been able to have a real talk and talk about a lot of stuff that seems really uncomfortable. But God, you value us and our purpose more than our comfortability. You said long ago, go out into the nations and I would be with you always. So God, we need you with us. We can't do it alone. We won't do it alone. So Holy Spirit, I pray you into this room. I pray you into their hearts. I pray you into their lives. I pray that you open their world to what you have for them, God. That purpose is restored. Hope is restored in lives and into this community because we're going to make a, be a church that's walking towards you and you will make a sound that will awaken a community. We desperately need you to be with us. We know that you are with us. Help us to feel it. Help us to know it. Help us to hear you and help us to follow you. God, we thank you for our love, for your love that you that you bore out for us 2,000 years ago on a cross. Now help us take that love and share it and reach out and change this community and this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.